All right, Tim Mackey of The Bible Project, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah. Um, or just Tim, as I prefer to yeah, call there you. there you go. Thank um, you. So, Tim, I'm really, really excited to get to chat with you. You've obviously uh, had a, a generous hand in this book, Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools. Mm -hmm. You were the early editor of this book alongside me. You wrote the foreword. You helped me do a book launch. You've been so generous at every turn. And here I am to pick one phrase out of the Lord's Prayer and just yeah. ring it out with you for everything it's worth. So I want to talk with you about the kind of prayer that's called adoration, um, which gets embodied in all sorts of ways. I think in a modern evangelical context, it's primarily expressed through song or praise. Um, and we see that all throughout Hebrew history. Many of the Psalms are adoration Psalms, you know, the Psalms of Ascent, which were sung on the way to the temple or as people ascended to the temple. Um, but then adoration is also uh, prayed not through song, but just through speech, uh, through writing in many ways. Um, but I think it can be a difficult a uh, type of prayer for people to access individually. And done in a communal context, it's quite common. Mm. But I think many people, uh, when they access it individually, mm. it feels forced or strange mm. or maybe even manipulative. Like, I guess this is like the criticism sandwich of prayer where mm. I'm telling God something really good about himself and then I'm going to ask something and then <laughs> I might sneak in something good again. Um, and so mm. I want to try to enter into... Mm the revolution of what Jesus was doing when he taught his disciples to pray. So they said, teach us to pray. And he started with, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is the first words off the lips of Jesus in his model prayer for us to, to imitate. And so I'd love if we could pick that apart one word at a time. Uh, so let's begin with Father. In the context in which Jesus was using the term Father, as a title for God. Uh, how revolutionary was that? What if that would have been familiar? And what if it would have been unfamiliar? How would it have struck those original hearers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, in the Hebrew Bible, or what Christians call the Old Testament, um, describing God as a father is not absent. Like, it's there in the Hebrew Bible. It's not the predominant uh, metaphor or image to talk about God's relationship to his people. Mm -hmm. um, there's Lord or Master, Rescuer, Redeemer, um, Creator. And Father is occasional um, in the Psalms and in the Prophets. Um, and so in, in Second Temple Judaism, that's the time period and culture of Judaism that Jesus um, grew up in, um, it, again, it wasn't uncommon. But um, Jesus' teachings, and this is just kind of stand out if you just compare it to other Jewish literature, his teachings clearly stand out as that's the predominant way that he referred to the God of Israel mm -hmm. as, as my father, the father, or our father. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. It would be, I guess the equivalent would be you're taking something that is there in your cultural heritage and... Uh, he's just turning the volume up to 11, so mm -hmm. to speak. So it, it's, it marks Jesus' teaching in a way that sets them apart. So is that revolutionary? I guess it, in one way you could say it could be. What, what's clear is that Jesus, out of his teachings and his prayers, had a deep, deep sense of intimacy with the God that he called Father. And um, there are many expressions of intimacy between God's people and God in the Hebrew Bible. And so it seems like Jesus really latched onto that mm -hmm. and that the title Father is really born out of his own experience of the, of the presence of the Father. And so in that sense, it's really significant and it's a uniquely Christian way of talking about God. Not that it's absent in, in Judaism, but it's not like the main way they do it. Yeah. And Interesting. It, something that interests me about it is that um, I perceive that the priests of Jesus' time would have related to God primarily through reverence and maybe occasionally through intimacy. And I don't know that to be true, but the temple rituals seem to 
lean heavily toward a more reverent approach, mm. at least as compared to the rituals of the church that yeah. I'm a part of today or yeah. the way that the common ways of worship I know today. Yeah. And I think I've always viewed Yahweh as a very reverent title toward God, maybe because of the origins of where it came from, yeah. you know, with yeah. Moses. And yeah. that's certainly a reverent moment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Jesus seems to flip that on its head where intimacy is the primary. Mm -hmm. And then there's also certainly reverence that we see moments mm -hmm. of, of incredible reverence mm -hmm. in Jesus' life. Does that square with your reading of Scripture? Mm -hmm. uh, kind of. Okay. But in some important ways, not quite. Okay. And so I think, and it might just be our, our own shared kind of upbringing in Protestant tradition mm -hmm. that tends to look on more um, liturgical or ritual forward practices of worship and intimacy with God as just, it's foreign. Right. It's not a part of like how I w was familiarized with it. Um, but it, it's, it's not always true that people within those types of traditions experience it as really austere and serious. Right. And, uh, and for me, actually, the, the easiest place to point to uh, is like King David, mm -hmm. where, I mean, he's the one who like brought the Ark of the Covenant in to right. establish the shrine uh, and the priesthood in Jerusalem, which he declared the new capital. And you read any of his prayers, and he's got a really intimate thing going True. on yeah so i think it's and he brought it in with joy not reverence yeah you yeah, know, yeah dancing yeah that's yeah. exactly right yeah which kind of made his wife uncomfortable yeah um so i just it's just good to name that um liturgy or ritual or more formal structures to to connect people to god don't necessarily uh create distance and we both know that in non-liturgical traditions you can be present for worship but actually be in your mind a million miles away so but it does seem like jesus really really believed that what was happening in the temple is something that was meant for all creation and was something that was meant especially for the poor and especially for people who, because of the Levitical ritual impurity laws, wouldn't even be allowed to enter the temple courts or pass the first um, gate. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interesting that it's Jesus primarily is taking his teaching ministry, the communities of the kingdom of God communities that he's shaping around this prayer. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he's taking them up to Galilee among communities of the sick and the poor and the marginalized. And to me, that tells as much of the story about the heartbeat of Jesus, that he wanted what happened in the temple to be something that was available for everyone, regardless of whether they qualified to go to yes. the temple or not. Yes. And the prayer of our Father really mm -hmm. uh, is at the center of that. Yeah, yeah so <clears throat> our Father in heaven, hallowed. Uh, so there's a a Greek word there yeah. in the Gospels that yeah. gets translated as hallowed, the English word, mm -hmm. which is still not an English word that <laughs> I really ever hear anyone <laughs> use these except, days. Except for Halloween. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so can yeah. you break down the meaning of yeah. that word for us, but maybe even just getting right to the root language? Yeah. What does this word mean? Yeah. Um, it, has, uh, it has the word holy at its root okay. in English, back to Latin. Um but it's it, uh, the most plain translation into our language would be, may your name be recognized as holy. Hmm. Um, so in uh, the Hebrew Bible, holiness is a word and it's a concept um, that is connected to the one true creator God's unique and one of a kind identity as the beautiful mind and heart that can with very words and a thought generate a universe. It's a pretty standout person. Mm -hmm. There's not very many persons who can do such a thing. So holiness was a way to describe the unique one and a kind status and identity of a God who can do that. Um, and so God is the Holy One of Israel. It's one of the um, main titles that the prophets use for God, the Holy One. Um, so it's God's holy and unique status uh, as creator, um, but also God invited a family 
to participate in that uniqueness by calling them to his purposes to be a vehicle of his blessing to the nations. And that is the drama of the Hebrew Bible, mm. just the, the, the family of Abraham. And really, actually, Jesus' prayer is crucial to understand. Why, why would Jesus encourage us to wish that God's name would be recognized or treated as holy? Um, and actually, sorry, we didn't go there, but in the, the Lord's Prayer, it has two halves. Mm -hmm. Each part with each half has three requests. Right. And the first three requests of the first half are all oriented towards our Father. Right. And they're, they're parallel. It's a form of um, Hebrew Old Testament poetic parallelism. Okay. So the three requests all kind of mutually illuminate each other. Hmm. May your name be recognized as holy. May your kingdom come. And may your will be done as it is in the skies, here also on the land. Hmm. And so those three requests are intimately connected with each other. Um, and what it presumes is that we live in a time or a place where God's name is not recognized as holy. Hmm. And, you know, for us to say that is one thing. But for a Jewish man um, to say that, who lives in Roman-occupied territory on their ancestral land, like there's a story underneath those three lines hmm. that God had called the nation of Israel to be uh, a kingdom of priests mm -hmm. and a people that he would bless with such supernatural abundance and life that the nations would look on and want in on, on the Eden life. Mm -hmm. um, what happened, you know, and this is the drama of the Hebrew Bible, is that God's own people forfeited that gift through idolatry and all kinds of injustice and neglecting the poor. And so God handed Israel over time and time again to imperial overlords. First it was Assyria, then to Babylon, then to Persia, then to Syria, and now Rome. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus' request to begin with this, this dream that God, the, the name of the God of Israel, the creator of all, would be recognized as holy, is uh, a, a request for God to act to bring his kingdom of justice and peace uh, once again here on the land as it is in the sky. And it seems like Jesus believed and acted as if that was his calling mm -hmm. and that this is what he was going to accomplish, which is really, I'm just, maybe I'm talking too long, but it's so, no. I, this is so fascinating that Jesus is revealed in this prayer is this mindset that what he was doing by taking the intimacy of connection to the Creator God outside the temple um, boundaries and taking them into these communities of the sick and the poor to create communities of justice, of right relationship, of reconciling people to mm -hmm. each other across boundary lines, and then teaching them to pray, may your name be recognized as holy. Um, like, in other words, he's actually doing the thing right. as he's teaching uh, uh, people to pray this prayer. Because what is it? That's a good question. Like, what is it that would make anybody in your neighborhood or mine, because we live in the same neighborhood, recognize like, God's name as holy? Yeah. Like, yeah. What, what would it take for our city to, like, have this wave of recognition that the name of God revealed through Jesus is holy? Like, what kinds of things mm -hmm. would do that? And it, I think it would be the kinds of things that Jesus was doing. Right. It would be reconciliation across dividing lines. Yeah. Communities of people that made no sense by the ethics of this world, only if another ethic had come to live in this world, you know, th yes. that was being then embodied in the yeah. interpersonal relational space between yeah. one another. Yes. Right. That's exactly right. So back to the thing about adoration then at the beginning, it's really remarkable that embedded in the first half of the Lord's Prayer, may your name be recognized as holy, which assumes that I think that, that God's character and purpose and heart for our world truly is holy mm -hmm. and is worth adoring. Mm -hmm. um, but then also at the same time, Jesus was teaching people to pray this prayer as the heartbeat of communities that were actually being birthed in the vision of restoring the holiness of God's reputation uh, in their land and in their time. So I, I, it'd be, what's an analogy? You know, you're giving someone a prayer or a mantra almost 
to build into their consciousness so that they actually start to become an embodiment and yes. the answer to the thing that you're hoping for. Yes. It's like a kind of prayer that shapes, potentially shapes people into the answer to the, the prayer. Yeah. Do, would it be accurate to say on an individual level that those three phrases you're naming build on one another or are connected sure. to one another? For sure. Yeah. Name recognizes holy, makes me a vessel through which his kingdom can come, mm -hmm. which is his will coming to bear yeah. on the land. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So, you know, I've always thought of this phrase um, as more for me than for God. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be the way that you're describing it. Mm -hmm. Like, God isn't up in heaven like, oh. I wish people would yeah, treat me as more holy. <laughs> come on, Tyler. <laughs> you, praise yeah. me, you know. Yeah, sure, but, sure. But when I praise God, I become more in touch with his the the reality of his character than the reality of my circumstances, which I have noticed, despite my best effort, never quite seem to consistently align yeah. with my will. Yeah. You know, I just cannot wrestle my circumstances into alignment with my will mm -hmm. for any uh, prolonged amount of time at all. Mm -hmm. And... And yet, when I pray, if I, it, it's almost like that phrase reminds me of the phrase the psalmist prays, awake my soul. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm saying, Tyler, come into alignment with who God is mm -hmm. before you pray another word. Mm -hmm. Because when you come into alignment with who God is, this incredible thing that can happen, mm -hmm. the things that you would pray would, will change. Mm -hmm. Or the way you would have prayed about the things you're going to pray about yeah, changes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Because you kind of remember who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a radically deep centering mm -hmm. way to begin your prayer. And that's a good way. Uh, just the idea that you're saying there, um, and for sure that it, that has to be part of why that is the opening line. Mm -hmm. um, when we lead in a place of prayer from the assumption that the drama of my story is kind of like the center mm -hmm. uh, and my orient orientation point, uh, then, you know, your prayers are going to go a certain kind of way. Um, but when you de-center the drama and whatever crises or confusions I might be having, and it's not like you're not diminishing them, and that's what the second half of the prayer is all about, being very honest about my own life circumstances. But the fact that the prayer doesn't begin there, uh, sh is surely significant that there is another person's story who's, and that drama is really the center mm -hmm. of the universe. And it's the drama of creation waking up to the holiness and the beauty and the love of God's character and purpose and name. And if that's the drama at the center, it just kind of re. Your you just everything. said the last bit that I wanted to ask you about. So there's this one last concept here that is obviously big in the Hebrew imagination, foreign to the modern Western imagination, at least. And that's the concept of the name. Yes. Right. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. we're told to pray, hallowed be thy name. Mm. We're told to pray in Jesus name. Yeah. So what what does that concept mean? Mm. What What's going on with. Um, the defense of a name. Um, and can you import us into that world to see it through Jesus's imagination? Yeah, it, it is kind of hard. It's kind of hard. Um, even for myself with like, I have two little boys and we came up, my wife and I came up with their names by just picking lists from a, a baby, you know, baby <laughs> yeah. names book, yeah. you know, and oh, that kind of sounds cool. And yeah. Like that one. Um, yeah. So imagine a cultural tradition. And this is true in, in uh, the Hebrew Bible where names, almost all names, are symbolic and meaningful, like full of meaning, mm -hmm. connected to their character, their destiny, their life story, or um, the call that God's placed on their lives, whether that person knows it or not. And so all of these characters, Abraham and Sarah, you know, Sarah's name means queen, hmm. for example, um, and uh, Abram, exalted father, and then Avraham, it gets changed to father of a multitude. So imagine yourself in a culture that for hundreds of generations, 
a person's name is this like embodiment of their character, their purpose, their story. Mm. Um, and so the, the personal covenant name of, of the God of Israel, Yahweh, um, is itself full of symbolic meaning. Right. Because um, it's the word he is. He is. Jesus oh, goes around changing people's names. Yeah, totally. you yeah know, that's right. For yes. for the the yeah. new destiny or identity or yeah. yes. vocation he's calling them to. That's right? yeah, exactly right. Yeah, where he changes Kephas, um, where he changes Peter mm -hmm. um, in, or Simon into Peter or Kephas, rock. Mm -hmm. So, um, so if you grew up in that environment, um, the way that the name of Yahweh, our God, is revered over generation and over generation builds up just this huge like reservoir of sig significance. And so what does it mean? What kinds of acts uh, display the character in the name of Yahweh, like in the Old Testament? And this would have been like, you know, 101 for Jesus. So the name of Yahweh is revealed to Moses at the burning bush as the liberator of the slaves from Egypt. And that is like, the most foundational association with God's name in the Hebrew Bible mm. as the one who identifies with um, the poor migrant community that is being marginalized and enslaved. And Yahweh associates his name with them such that when Moses goes to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's response is, I don't acknowledge Yahweh, mm -hmm. therefore I won't let the people go. Mm. Like, I don't know that name. Yeah, and so I don't hallow that name. Yeah, exactly. Therefore, his kingdom will not come yeah, here. Yeah, that's wow. a, that's exactly right. Wow. So it's interesting. I just learned this recently huh. that um, there are uh, there's this phrase that appears in the Exodus narrative um, that God's going to bring the ten signs or the ten plagues so that Egypt or Pharaoh will know that I am Yahweh, or they will know that my name is Yahweh. That line appears seven times. Mm -hmm. which is a hugely symbolic uh, number for, right. for completeness and fullness. Right. It appears seven times in the Exodus story um, as if it's the complete revelation of Yahweh's name, which is to create, which is to bring the mighty oppressor down from their throne. And as Hannah says on her prayer in 1 Samuel, to take the poor and oppressed and to put them up on a seat with nobles and princes. And that's Yahweh's name. That's the primary story attached to Yahweh's reputation in the Hebrew Bible. And that's the reputation that was compromised when Israel um, failed to be covenant, covenantally loyal to their God and to become just like Babylon and Assyria, another rich, powerful nation neglecting the poor. And Yahweh's name is what Jesus is praying. Mm. Uh, to be restored among the nations, but he doesn't. He 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 recast that name as we talked about to our Father, um, and the mission and the communities that he was beginning and starting was how he believed that Yahweh's name was going to be uh, restored as holy. Mm. So it is hard for us to think about what that really meant, like for Jesus that his father's name be restored. But, I, you know, we can think of maybe friends um, who their name or reputation has gotten tarnished mm -hmm. legitimately or illegitimately. Right. And what would it mean for somebody's name or reputation to be restored so that when you hear it, you don't think, oh, right. oh that person, oh, that was terrible, what happened to them? But you think, you know, when you have some, like a good friend it's, that you love yeah, and you hear their name. Yeah, it's a dignity given back. And you're like, yeah. oh, so-and-so. Right. Just hearing the name pulls up a whole story but it's beautiful and good and like that's what that's what the prayer is about and that's so rad to think about that yeah. yeah 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 and so for for the average person who is trying to pray as jesus taught them to pray mm. it seems that prayer begins mm. with knowing who god is mm. which then informs everything that follows because that informs who i am mm -hmm. That informs who you are to me, because if God is who he's been revealed to be in Jesus, then it redefines not only the words that I'm about to pray, but hopefully 
the prayer I go on living after I say amen, mm -hmm. right? It, it, it redefines the way that I think about myself and what is defining of me on that day. Mm -hmm. it, it means that mm -hmm. the, the ultimate, I guess a question I ask myself sometimes is what for me constitutes a well-lived day? Mm -hmm. Is it the number of items checked off my to-do list? Is it that day flowing according to my agenda? Is it fun or adventure in that day or some? Or does hallowed be thy name reconstitute what is worth living for today? Yeah, yeah. Did, did the activities I participate in in some way fit into this drama? Of the restoration of our father's reputation among the nations. Yeah. Um, did, did I some way participate in some piece of God's love and justice and mercy touching earth? Mm -hmm. um, that's what you're saying. Yes. If, praying, the, praying the prayer. All it really it, it invites you to see yourself as a part of a drama. Yes. The, like we were talking to, about to earlier. inhabit a story. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and I think that's exactly how the prayer is meant. To shape us, which is really, I think, how the the second half then unfolds from that, mm -hmm. which is which is a request for a provision mm -hmm. that God would provide for my needs. It's a request um, for forgiveness, mm -hmm. forgive us as we have been forgiven, and then it's a request to trust that no matter what trial is thrown at me today, I can trust that my Father will deliver me from the evil one. And so, uh, but all of that of the drama the, of our daily lives fits within this bigger narrative context in the first part of the prayer. It's like Jesus knew how to craft a really good prayer. Right. <laughs> it's <laughs> almost like Jesus. <laughs> it's really, cause, but it's also so short compared to many other prayer, sure. Jewish prayers of the day. Because mm -hmm. there are similarities between the Lord's Prayer and other, other right. prayers of, of the time period. But the fact that it's so short but just there's a universe in the prayer, right? Uh, and that's surely a part of why we're still saying it today, mm -hmm. um, which is a beautiful part of its legacy. So, so if you're watching or listening, here's how Jesus teaches us to pray. He says, "Before you utter a request, mm -hmm. before you confess a sin, mm -hmm. before you pray for the need of, of another, mm -hmm. before you." Uh, ask for deliverance or protection of any kind before mm. any of that. Make sure that you remember mm. who it is that you're praying to and the story that you're living within. Mm. Because as you do, your prayers will be redefined and your living will be redefined. Mm.